the Granville Hotel had always been an enigma wrapped in the fog of my small town's collective amnesia. A towering relic of opulence now crumbled into ruin. It loomed on the outskirts like a specter of the past that everyone sought to ignore. But me, I'm Ellen, a local librarian with an appetite for history, especially the kind that whispers from the shadows. The hotel's tale was a patchwork of horror, stitched together by hushed voices and yellowed newspaper clippings. 20 years ago, the grandeur of the Granville was stained in crimson when a series of gruesome murders left its halls barren and its future sealed. The authorities concluded with an unsatisfactory explanation, boarding up the memories along with the windows. Yet, rumors of dark deeds and ghostly apparitions never ceased. My obsession began subtly, like the first chill of autumn. It crept through my dreams, infusing them with visions of the Granville's gilded mirrors and blood, soaked carpets. Each night, I'd sleepwalk through its corridors, not as a spectator, but as a participant, feeling the dread that once permeated its air. Tonight was different. The urge that pulled me to the Granville was irresistible, a silent siren call that wouldn't be drowned out by reason. I found myself seated at my worn kitchen table, surrounded by the dim glow of candles, as if preparing for some arcane ritual. The clippings and photographs lay scattered before me like tarot cards, foretelling a grim future. I needed to see it, to touch the reality behind my nightmares. So I grabbed my flashlight, the weight of it reassuring against my palm, and drove through the deserted streets. The hotel emerged from the darkness, its silhouette a jagged scar against the night sky. A loose board, pried away countless times by thrill-seekers and ghost hunters, was my entry into the past. As I stepped through, a musty odor enveloped me, the scent of decayed grandeur and forgotten secrets. The beam of my flashlight cut through the darkness, revealing peeling wallpaper and fractured chandeliers. The silence was oppressive, yet beneath it was a palpable heartbeat, as if the hotel itself was alive and breathing with me. I could feel the echoes of laughter and screams intermingled in a symphony of madness. My hand trailed along the banister as I ascended the grand staircase, each step creaking underfoot like a moan from beneath. The second floor held the infamous room 217, where the first body was found. A bride in her gown, her life extinguished on what should have been her happiest day. The door now stood ajar, inviting me into her sanctuary turned tomb. As I crossed the threshold, a cold breeze brushed my cheek, and for a moment I was her. Caught in a flash of white lace and shattered dreams, my heart raced with her terror, my breath short and sharp as if chased by an unseen assailant. Shaking off the phantom emotions, I continued my exploration. Each room told a story, a tableau of tragedy frozen in time. Toys lay abandoned mid-play in what was once a child's paradise. A suitcase sat packed but never claimed. Wine glasses poised for a toast that would never come. It wasn't until I reached the end of the corridor that I heard it. A soft whimper from behind one of the doors. Instinctively, I approached, pressing my ear against the cool wood. The sound was unmistakable. A cry for help muffled by years, but never silenced. With a deep breath to steady my trembling hands, I pushed open the door. The room inside was unlike any other in the hotel, pristine and untouched by decay. It was as though it had been waiting for me, preserved for this very moment. And there, in the center of the room, was an old tape recorder. Compelled by forces beyond my understanding, I pressed play. The room filled with a voice from the past, clear and resonant with fear. If you're hearing this, it means I was right. They never really left. The hotel keeps them. Keeps us. And now, yo. The tape clicked off, and silence swallowed me once more. But it wasn't just silence. It was anticipation of what I could not tell. I had come seeking ghosts, but instead, I found their grief. Their rage a lingering presence that clung to my soul like a second skin. The Granville had revealed its heart to me, 
and in return it had claimed a peace of mine. I knew then that my life would never be the same again. The stories I would tell would no longer be just recollections from history. They would be confessions of my own haunted experience. As I left room 217 behind and made my way back through the crumbling halls of the Granville Hotel, one thing became clear. This was only the beginning. The Granville Hotel's once. Lavish foyer yawned before me, a gaping maw of history that dared me to step further into its depths. My flashlight's beam danced across the grand staircase, its red carpet now dulled and dusty. Swallowed the light hungrily. The air was thick with the scent of mold and the weight of years long past. I tread softly, the sound of my footsteps muffled by the oppressive silence that seemed to press in from all sides. The whispers of the town's people played in my mind like a broken record, cautioning, warning, but their fears only fueled my need to uncover the truth that lay buried within these walls. The hotel seemed to watch me, its unseen eyes tracking my every move. The portraits of long-departed guests hung crookedly on the walls, their painted gazes following me with an intensity that felt almost alive. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was an intruder here, not in the physical sense, but in a temporal one, as if I had stumbled into a time that was not my own. As I ascended the staircase, the wood creaked beneath my weight, groaning like a slumbering beast disturbed from its rest. The second floor held the guest rooms, each door a sentinel to its own secret history. I chose one at random, or perhaps it chose me, the door slightly ajar as if inviting me in. Inside, the room was shrouded in shadows that my light could not fully dispel. A four-poster bed stood against one wall, its canopy hanging in tatters. A thick layer of dust coated everything, undisturbed for decades. Yet amidst this scene of abandonment, a single object on the bedside table caught my eye. A diary, its leather cover cracked and worn. Compelled by an unseen force, I opened it to a random page and began to read. The handwriting was elegant, but frantic. The words of a guest who had stayed here during the hotel's final days. They spoke of strange noises in the night, of laughter and weeping so vivid they must have been real. They wrote of a feeling of being watched, of shadows that moved just beyond the corner of their eye. I flipped through more pages, each entry more disturbed than the last. The guest had begun to unravel, their sanity frayed by whatever haunted these halls. The final entry was the most chilling. A simple sentence scrawled across the page with such force that it had torn through the paper. It is not the dead we should fear. A sudden noise snapped me back to reality, a thump from somewhere within the hotel. It was deliberate, unmistakable, the sound of something moving with intention. My heart raced as I carefully closed the diary and placed it back on the table. I couldn't explain why, but I felt an overwhelming need to follow the sound. It drew me down the hallway, past more silent guardians of wood and paint, to a door at the far end. This one was wide open, as if whatever had made the noise was inviting me, and was wide open as if whatever had made the noise was inviting me, or out. With every fiber of my being screaming for caution, I crossed the threshold and found myself in what must have been a ballroom. The grand chandeliers hung low from the ceiling, their crystals glinting in my flashlight's beam like ghostly stars. And there, in the center of the dance floor, lay a child's doll, one eye missing, its dress a patchwork of stains. The atmosphere shifted suddenly. It was as if, with this discovery, I had stirred something in the air itself, a charge that ran through me. Cold and electric, the doll was a nexus, a key to understanding the true horror of Granville Hotel. As I stood there pondering its significance, a whisper carried across the room, so faint I thought I might have imagined it. Find me. The voice was neither malevolent nor kind, but it bore an urgency that could not be ignored. It resonated with the same energy that had drawn me to this place, 
a call that had echoed through my dreams and now reverberated through the decaying splendor of Granville. I couldn't leave now. The story was unraveling before me, its threads begging to be followed through the labyrinth of time and terror that this hotel embodied. And so, with a resolve that surprised even myself, I pocketed the doll and moved deeper into the darkness, driven by an insatiable need to uncover what lay at the heart of these echoes from the past. The diary's entries ceased abruptly, the last page ending mid-sentence as if the writer had been interrupted or compelled to flee. A chill ran down my spine, not from the cold, but from the realization that the fears of the diary's owner mirrored my own. The laughter, the weeping, the perpetual sensation of being observed. It was all too familiar, resonating with the very essence of my nightly haunts. Closing the diary, I placed it back on the nightstand with a reverence reserved for the most sacred texts. It felt as though the room itself had exhaled, a release of breath held for far too long. The shadows seemed to retreat slightly, granting me a momentary reprieve from their oppressive embrace. I continued my exploration, moving from room to room, each one a carbon copy of Desire. The faded opulence was a stark reminder of what once was, a monument to both grandeur and grotesquerie. It was in the ballroom, however, that I found what I hadn't known I was searching for. The grand chandelier lay shattered on the floor, its crystals scattered like diamonds upon a beach of decay. Around it, the dance floor told a tale of chaos frozen in time. Scratches marred the once, polished surface, deep grooves that spoke of a struggle, of desperation clawing at the wood. And there, in the center of the floor, was a singular impression, an imprint of a body, as if someone had fallen or been pushed. No dust disturbed the clear outline, and I couldn't help but feel that this was a message meant for me to find. A sound broke my reverie, a soft sobbing that seemed to emanate from nowhere and everywhere at once. I followed it, past the ballroom and down a narrow service corridor that led to the bowels of the hotel. The air grew colder as I descended, sobbing growing louder with each step. The corridor ended at an unassuming door, its paint peeling from years of neglect. The crying was clear now, a lamentation that spoke of unendurable loss and pain. My hands trembled as I reached for the knob, turning it slowly. The room beyond was unlike any other in the hotel, pristine, untouched by time, with a crib in the corner. Above it hung mobiles that spun gently in a breeze I could not feel, and there, swaddled in blankets that were impossibly white amidst the surrounding dissay, lay a doll. Its glass eyes stared blankly at the ceiling, and as I stepped closer, the sobbing ceased. I recoiled as realization dawned upon me. The doll was antique, a collector's item perhaps, but its presence here was no accident. It was a symbol, a representation of loss so profound that it had imprinted itself upon the very fabric of the Granville. I knew then that I could not leave without understanding why. The answers I sought were here, woven into the tapestry of tragedy that enshrouded this place. The doll was a key to unraveling the mystery, a key I was determined to turn. As I reached out to lift the doll from its crib, its eyes seemed to focus on mine, and in that moment, I felt a connection to every soul who had walked these halls. Their stories pulsed through me, a confluence of joy and sorrow that had seeped into the walls and floors of the Granville Hotel. I held my breath as I gently picked up the doll. It was heavier than it looked, its porcelain skin cold to the touch. Underneath it lay another diary, this one far older than the first. Its pages were yellowed with age, but as I began to read, time fell away. The story unfolded before me a tale of love and madness that had spiraled into darkness. The Granville had been more than just a hotel. It had been a home to those who walked its halls. And when tragedy struck, ripping through the fabric of their lives like a cruel storm, it left behind wounds that would never heal. The doll was not merely an object left behind, 
It was a vessel for memories too painful to bear. The diary chronicled the life of its owner, a woman whose love for her child transcended death itself. I clutched the diary to my chest, knowing that I had found what I had unknowingly come for, to bear witness to the story that demanded to be told. My flashlight flickered then died, plunging me into darkness. But I was not afraid. For in that eternal moment, between breaths, I understood that every shadow in the Granville Hotel was simply love, twisted by grief. And as I made my way back through the silent halls with only the moonlight to guide me, I felt an overwhelming sense of peace. The Granville secrets were mine now, woven into my being, and through me, they would find their voice in the world beyond these haunted walls. The door creaked open, its protest adding to the symphony of sobs that now filled the room. The pristine condition of the space was jarring, a stark contrast to the dilapidation that reigned outside. The walls were painted a soft, calming blue, untouched by the decay that had claimed the rest of the Granville Hotel. It was as if I had stepped through a portal into another world, one that had been waiting just for me. The crib, white and immaculate, stood out like a beacon in the dimness. Above it, mobiles hung silent and still, their whimsical shapes casting long, distorted shadows across the walls. The sobbing had ceased abruptly as I entered, replaced by a silence so complete it buzzed in my ears. Compelled by an inexplicable urge, I approached the crib. Peering inside, I found it empty, save for a plush toy, a rabbit, its fur once white, now tinged with the yellow of age. It was positioned in the center, as if placed there with deliberate care. My reflection in a polished silver rattle caught my eye, and for a moment, I didn't recognize the haunted eyes staring back at me. I turned away from the crib and noticed a series of framed photographs on the dresser. They depicted the hotel in its heyday, filled with smiling guests and diligent staff. But one photo captured my attention, a staff group photo where one face stood out. It was the bellhop from my dreams, his eyes hollow with the same despair I'd seen in my own reflection. As I studied his face, the air grew colder and a lullaby began to play softly, seeping into the room from some unseen music box. The tune was familiar, one my mother used to hum to me as a child. How could this be? My heart raced as I realized that this room held answers to questions I hadn't dared to ask. I left the room reluctantly, feeling an invisible thread pulling me back as I closed the door. The hotel's secrets were slowly revealing themselves, weaving a tapestry of tragedy and mystery that I was becoming a part of. I made my way back to the ballroom, where the imprint on the dance floor seemed even more pronounced now. It was then that I heard it, a faint giggle, a child's giggle, followed by the pitter, patter of little feet above me. There were no children in the Granville Hotel, at least not anymore. The sound drew me back upstairs toward the source. As I ascended, I could almost see fleeting shadows turning corners just out of sight. The laughter grew louder, echoing through the halls until it was all around me. I reached the third floor, where the most luxurious suites once hosted the hotel's most esteemed guests. The laughter led me to a door at the end of the hall. Unlike the others, this door was pristine, its brass handle gleaming in my flashlight's beam. With a deep breath to steady my nerves, I grasped the handle and pushed open the door. Inside, the suite was alive with echoes of the past. Laughter, music, glasses clinking, ghostly figures danced across the room in a waltz that had no end. And there, among them, was a little boy, no more than five, running playfully between the dancers. He stopped when he saw me and smiled with a knowing that belied his years. Come find me, he whispered, before darting into the throng of specters. As he disappeared, so did they all, leaving me alone once again in silence and darkness. But now I had a mission, a child's challenge, that I could not ignore. The pieces were falling into place, the diary's fearsome entries, the untouched nursery, 
the bellhop's desolate eyes, and now this spectral child. Each element was a thread in a larger narrative. One that I was unraveling thread by thread. Determined to find answers, I moved deeper into the suite. The boy's laughter still rang in my ears as I stepped into what must have been his living quarters. A room frozen in time, waiting for its occupant to return. And on a small desk lay another diary, much like the first, but smaller. This one bore no dust. It waited for me, as I opened it to the first page. Written in a child's scrawl were words that sent shivers down my spine. Tonight is the night they'll all remember. The penmanship wavered with each entry as if written in haste or fear. And as I turned each page, I realized that this diary held not just childish musings, but witnessed accounts from eyes that saw too much. The last entry was dated, the very night of the Granville Hotel's final horror. The words were smudged by tears, or perhaps something worse. They're here for me now. The diary ended there. My mind raced to connect each haunting revelation as I stood in the silence of that lost boy's sanctuary. What had happened here? Who were they? And how did this child's fate intertwine with my own relentless nightmares? I needed to delve deeper into this mystery, to understand how these spectral threads tied together and how unraveling them might lead to my own undoing or perhaps to salvation for us both. With resolve stealing my nerves, I closed the diary and prepared to follow wherever this ghostly child led me next. The faint melody that had begun to play was not just in my mind. It resonated through the ballroom, a soft, haunting piano tune that seemed to seep from the very walls. I followed the sound, drawn to it as inexorably as a moth to a flame. It led me back through the hotel's labyrinthine corridors, towards the grand piano in the lounge, its keys yellowed with age. As I approached, the music grew louder, more insistent, I could almost make out a figure seated at the piano, their back to me, shoulders moving with the rhythm of the haunting melody. But when I blinked, the figure vanished, leaving only the echo of music that continued to fill the room. I placed my hand on the piano, half, expecting it to be warm from the phantom pianist's touch. It was cold, yet a single note sounded as if pressed by an unseen finger. The note hung in the air, a lonely beacon in the silence that followed. It was then I noticed a set of sheet music propped on the stand, a lullaby, the same one that had played in the nursery. The connection between the rooms and their untouched state suggested they were part of a larger story, a story that was somehow related to me. The bellhop in the photograph, the lullaby from my childhood, the lullaby from my childhood, they were threads in a web that was ensnaring me with every step I took. I needed to understand how these pieces fit together. I returned to the second floor, to the diary that had started it all. The entries spoke of a staff member who had lost something precious, something that drove him to madness. Was it the bellhop? Was his loss connected to the nursery? The hotel seemed to breathe around me, its walls pulsing with untold stories. I could hear whispers now, not just sobbing. They were indistinct, yet they seemed to be guiding me, urging me onward. I found myself standing before a door I hadn't noticed before. It was different from the others, older, with a brass plaque that read manager. My hand shook as I turned the knob and pushed it open. The office inside was a time capsule. Dusty ledgers lay open on the desk their pages filled with neat handwriting, detailing the hotel's comings and goings. And there, among the records, was a newspaper clipping dated from the hotel's final days. The headline sent a shiver down my spine. Tragedy at Granville. Bellhop's child found dead. The article told a harrowing tale of loss and grief that had unfolded within these very walls. A child's accidental death. A father's descent into despair a story that echoed through time and seemed to have chosen me as its confessor. I felt eyes upon me once again, but this time, I was not afraid. I will uncover your story, I whispered into the silence. I will piece together 
what has been torn apart. The whispers grew louder in approval, and I knew what I had to do next. The diary, the nursery, the bellhop's pain. They were all connected, and somehow, they were connected to me as well. I left the office with resolve in my heart. The hotel's secrets were like ghosts, intangible yet present, and I would chase them until they materialized into answers. The Granville Hotel had many more stories to tell, and I was determined to listen. As I walked through the hallway, the shadows seemed to lean in closer, as if eager to share their whispered truths. And amidst those shadows, I could almost see him, the bellhop, his eyes filled with sorrow and gratitude. The story would continue, and I would be its vessel. The manager's office door swung open with a reluctant groan, revealing a room shrouded in the thick dust of abandonment. The air was stale, heavy with the scent of old paper and lost time. I stepped inside, the whispers that had beckoned me growing fainter, as if the room itself was absorbing the sound. The desk was a grand thing, carved from dark wood and laden with ledgers and papers that hinted at a meticulous hand. Among these, a journal lay open, the ink faded but legible, the ink faded but legible, the handwriting matching that of the diary from the nightstand. It was a connection, another thread weaving through the fabric of this mystery. I began to read, the entries detailing the mundane aspects of hotel management but slowly unraveling into something else. Something darker. The manager spoke of a staff member, the bellhop from my visions, whose demeanor had changed after the sudden disappearance of his young daughter. The hotel had searched, but the girl was never found, and grief had transformed into obsession. As I read on, the entries became disjointed, filled with ramblings about a melody that haunted the manager's dreams a lullaby that seemed to emanate from the walls of the hotel itself. It was the same melody I had heard, the one that had led me to the nursery and the piano. The whispers returned, louder now, and among them, I could discern a child's voice calling out in longing. I followed the sound, leaving the office behind as I moved through the hotel's corridors. The voice led me to a stairwell I hadn't noticed before, hidden behind a tapestry that depicted the hotel in its prime. Descending the stairwell, I found myself in a part of the hotel that felt older than the rest. The architecture here was different, the air thick with a sense of foreboding. The child's voice grew louder, more desperate as I navigated the narrow hallways. Finally, I arrived at a door that was unlike any other in the hotel. It was made of iron and bore intricate carvings that seemed to writhe and twist in the dim light. The child's voice was coming from behind it, pleading for help. With a deep breath, I pushed open the door and stepped through. Inside, I found a room that defied explanation. It was a circular chamber, its walls lined with mirrors that reflected my image into infinity. In the center stood a pedestal, and upon it, rested an object that drew my gaze, the silver rattle from the nursery. As I approached it, the room began to spin, the mirrors blurring into a vortex of light and shadow. The child's voice crescendoed to a scream before cutting off abruptly as I touched the rattle. Silence fell like a shroud. Then, in the mirror before me, an image appeared. It was the bellhop, his eyes filled with tears as he held a little girl's hand. His daughter. The image flickered and faded. But I understood now. The hotel was reliving its greatest tragedy, unable to let go of the past. I left the chamber with the rattle in hand, knowing what I must do. The hotel's sorrow was my sorrow. Its story was now intertwined with my own and I would not rest until I had unraveled every last secret hidden within its walls. As long shadows cast by the setting sun stretched across the floors, I felt a strange sense of purpose. The Granville Hotel had chosen me to bear witness to its haunting history, and I was determined to bring peace to its lingering spirits, no matter what it took. The whispers had ceased. Now there was only silence, 
a silence waiting to be broken by the truth of what had transpired within these haunted rooms. And so, armed with newfound knowledge and a resolve as unwavering as the very foundations of the hotel itself, I prepared to delve deeper into its mysteries. Beyond the iron door lay a chamber that seemed untouched by time. The walls were lined with shelves filled with ancient books. Their spines cracked and faded. In the center of the room stood a pedestal, and atop it, a single book lay open, its pages yellowed with age, but its words written in a hand so fresh it could have been inked just moments ago. The whispers had ceased, replaced by a silence so dense it felt like a physical presence. I approached the pedestal, drawn to the book as if by some magnetic force. The writing within was not that of ledgers or diaries, but of incantations and rituals, arcane knowledge that spoke of the veil between worlds and how to bend it. It was then I realized the true horror of the Granville Hotel. The bellhop, driven mad by grief, had sought forbidden knowledge to find his daughter, believing she had been taken not from this world, but to another. The manager had discovered this. His journal entries a record of his descent into madness as he tried to stop the bellhop from tearing apart the very fabric of reality. The lullaby, the nursery, the piano, all were focal points for energy that the bellhop had harnessed in his desperate quest, and I was the key. My own memories and experiences inexplicably intertwined with the hotel's dark history. I felt a chill as I read the final passage of the book. It spoke of a ritual that required a bloodline connection, a descendant who would unknowingly complete what had been started so many years ago. My hands trembled as I processed the implications. Was I that descendant? Was this why I was drawn to the Granville Hotel? I closed the book and left the chamber, sealing the iron door behind me. The hotel seemed to sigh, a sound of resignation and sorrow that echoed through its halls. I understood now that I needed to end this cycle to prevent the bellhop's tragedy from claiming any more souls. As I ascended the hidden stairwell, I could hear the piano once more, its melody now one of farewell. The hotel was releasing me, its story told, its secrets revealed, but I knew that before I could leave, there was one final task I must complete. I returned to the nursery and took the plush rabbit from the crib. It was time to lay the past to rest, to give the bellhop and his daughter the peace they had been denied. With the rabbit clutched tight, I made my way to the heart of the hotel, the ballroom where it all began. There, in the center of the dance floor, I placed the toy in whispered words of release, an impromptu ritual of my own. As I spoke, the air grew lighter, and the shadows receded. The hotel seemed to breathe a sigh of relief as if a great weight had been lifted from its walls. I walked out of the Granville Hotel as dawn broke, leaving behind the echoes of a lullaby that would no longer haunt my dreams. The door closed with a soft click, and I knew that it would not open again. The story of the hotel was complete, its final chapter written by my hand. And as I walked away, I realized that sometimes horror is not found in ghosts or ghouls, but in the depths of human sorrow and the lengths to which we will go to reclaim what was lost. The nursery, once a sanctuary of innocence and lullabies, now felt like a crypt of silent stories, a place where the echoes of the past were waiting to be set free. The plush rabbit, now in my hands, seemed to pulse with a life of his own its stitched eyes staring back at me with a depth that was unsettling. I could no longer deny my connection to this place. The diary, the lullaby, and the arcane book had all led me here. The hotel's whispers had quieted, as if every specter that roamed its halls was holding its breath, watching me with unseen eyes. With the rabbit clutched close, I moved to the window, the moon casting a pale glow over the room. It was time to confront the final piece of this puzzle, the bellhop's ritual. The book had been clear. To break the cycle, one must reverse the steps taken, untangle the web that had been woven with such sorrowful threads. I began to recite the incantations from the book, 
each word a somber note in the requiem of the hotel's history. As I spoke, the rabbit seemed to grow heavier in my arms, as if it were absorbing the weight of the ritual. The air grew cold, and a wind whispered through the room, stirring the dust into dancing apparitions. The room began to shift, the walls blurring and reforming into scenes of the past. The bellhop with his daughter, laughing and playing, then his descent into madness as he searched for her through realms beyond comprehension. And finally, the manager, desperately trying to seal away the knowledge that should have never been unearthed. As I reached the climax of the ritual, a spectral figure emerged from where the shadows gathered thickest. It was the bellhop, his eyes hollow with loss, but alight with a flicker of hope. He reached out, and I understood what needed to be done. I handed him the rabbit, and as he took it, a smile broke through the anguish that had marred his face for so long. There was a sound like a sigh, and the specter of the bellhop began to fade, his form dissolving into motes of light that drifted upward and vanished. The nursery returned to normal, but it felt different now, lighter, as if a great burden had been lifted from it. The hotel was silent as I left the nursery. The whispers had ceased. The haunting lullaby was no more. I walked through the corridors with a sense of purpose, making my way to the lobby. There was no turning back. The Granville Hotel had revealed its secrets, and in doing so, had given me a new path. As I stepped outside, the first light of dawn was breaking over the horizon. The hotel behind me stood silent and still, a monument to memories and echoes. But it was free now. And it was free now. And so was I. The story of the Granville Hotel would live on, whispered in hushed tones by those who dared to delve into its mysteries. But for me, it was time to let go and move forward into a day that promised new beginnings and a future unburdened by the shadows of yesterday. And with that final thought, I walked away from the Granville Hotel, leaving its ghosts to rest in peace at last. The nursery, once a place of haunting melodies and whispered secrets, now lay silent, a sanctum of peace. The spectral visitations, the echoes of despair, had all but dissipated, leaving behind a quiet that was both solemn and soothing. The Granville Hotel, with its gilded mirrors and velvet drapes, seemed to exhale a long-held breath, as if it were finally at rest. I stood in the center of the nursery, the weight of the ritual lifted from my shoulders, the plush rabbit, the innocent toy that had become a vessel for so much pain, now lay motionless, just a simple object once again. The bellhop spirit had found its release, reunited with a memory of his daughter, in a moment that transcended time and space. As dawn's early light began to filter through the windows, casting away the last shadows of night, I felt the hotel's story drawing to its close. The air was no longer thick with mystery. The walls no longer whispered. It was as if the building itself had been holding its breath, waiting for the resolution that had finally come. I descended the grand staircase, each step echoing in the hushed foyer. The chandelier overhead sparkled with a new brilliance, as if it too had been cleansed of the somber history it had illuminated for so many years. Reaching the front doors, I paused to glance back at the grandeur of the Granville Hotel one last time. It was no longer a place of horror, but a monument to redemption. The hotel would remain, its corridors and rooms imprinted with the story that had unfolded within them, but the malevolence that had once reigned was now just an echo of the past. I pushed open the doors and stepped out into the freshness of morning. The sun crested the horizon, painting the sky in hues of gold and pink. The world outside was oblivious to the hotel's history, to the reconciliation that had occurred within its walls. As I walked away from the Granville Hotel, I knew that its story would stay with me forever, but it was time to let go to leave behind the whispers and lullabies and step into a day that promised new beginnings. And so, the story of the Granville Hotel was complete. A tale of loss and longing, of madness and mystery, 
finally resolved not by more horror, but by an act of love that echoed through the ages, the hotel would stand as a sentinel to history. Its chapters closed, its spirits at peace. As life moved inexorably forward, beyond its timeless walls. Thanks for listening. If you like the story, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, and I look forward to your comments. See you in the next video.